Okay, so the first thing that um, I want to go over, and actually, if you guys could have paper out. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. It's just a couple quick notes that I want to give you about some changes in the persuasive essay, which are really important because they were just made this week. Um, originally, that persuasive essay for senior thesis was going to be three solutions, and they had to be federal, state, and local. But um, as we were just sort of brainstorming and processing like what that would look like, it seems like federal and state could end up being too repetitive and too similar. So what we've changed it to, and this is what I want you to write down, is government and citizen. So you're only coming up with two solutions, government and citizen. And even though all of the um, staff have been notified via email because this is a recent change, you know, if, if, if your mentor isn't a person who regularly reads their email, you could show up for a mentor meeting and they could still be thinking you need three solutions, blah, blah, blah. The main person who's going to be helping you with this anyway is Ms. Cobb. You guys are going to be spending a lot of time in government class coming up with what these solutions are anyway, so you're going to be pretty well covered. Okay. Now for um, the autobiography, how many of you were thinking, are you taking notes on your phone or are you texting? No, I'm taking notes. Taking notes on your phone? Okay. But, how many of you were, nice name, how many of you were thinking of doing a persuasive essay for your autobiography? Now that would mean that you were going to focus on the solutions for your book. Oh really? Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, maybe? Okay. So let me just give you a little bit more info so that if you want to do the persuasive, you're good to go, okay? Right now, um, does anybody regularly go on my wiki space and look at all the handouts I put up there and stuff oh, like yeah, that? Oh, yeah, good. Yeah? Okay, good. All right, awesome. If even one person does it, I feel a little bit better. Were you kidding? Yeah. Being sarcastic? God. I put a lot of time into that. Only when you send us to go in and I go. Okay, well, anyway, the rubric and the outlines have been there for like, I don't know, a month. But... Um, but the persuasive outline that's on there, it doesn't reflect these new changes. Okay, so I'm going to edit that and repost it. But I'm going to go over it with you so that when you look at it, you can just make these outlines in your own head too. So, I mean these changes. So what does it look like is more like the debates, what we're doing. Okay, a normal persuasive essay is based all around a central claim. Smoking should be made illegal. Why? Because it pollutes the air, causes cancer, whatever. So you have your three body paragraphs, right? And then you have this one rebuttal paragraph which addresses the counter argument. And it's all focused around your claim. So if your claim was smoking should be made illegal, the topic sentence for that is going to be around the fact that it should not, that somebody else would have said it should not be made illegal. And you're addressing that. So do you remember how during the debates, when you got up and presented your side, the other side got up and poked holes in your argument, so to speak. And then your rebuttal person would have gotten up and their topic sentence, if you will, would have been, in response to my opponent's argument that smoking should not be made illegal, and then here's what you have to say about what they would have said. Do you guys all remember that? Yeah. Now, intercession, we are going to spend, like all of intercession, reviewing all of this like in detail. But just for the sake of like you writing your persuasive your um, persuasive essay on autobiography, I'm just gonna go over it like nutshell version. Okay, so if anyone's lost on this, just do the research paper. Because remember you get to choose. You can either do a research paper on your autobiography or persuasive. Okay? And if you're doing research, it's just the outline that you've already been using. Okay, that straight outline that you've already been using. Okay? So It'll look like, now, the other thing is that because your persuasive essay is about solutions, two totally different solutions, you can't have one central paragraph addressing the solutions, okay, together. So what you'll have is a paragraph which is your government solution, so write that down. So that first body paragraph would be your government solution. Your second body paragraph is going to be your rebuttal to the counter argument. And 
how will I know what the counter argument is? Well, because in your topic sentence, you'll say something like, in response to my opponent's argument, that um, abortion should not be made illegal, you know, whatever it is. Yeah, so like the second body paragraph is a rebuttal to the counter argument for your solution. It's just your government solution. Now, your third body paragraph is your citizen solution. A citizen solution is going to be things like, what could an individual do? As opposed to laws and things like that, what could an individual do? Well, as an individual, I could boycott restaurants that use styrofoam, you know, whatever. All right, the fourth body paragraph will be the rebuttal to the counter argument to your citizen solution, right? Because the counter argument could be, well, that's unrealistic to stop using styrofoam because when you're poor, styrofoam is the best choice because it's cheapest. And people who are poor are really not going to be prioritizing an expensive product, you know, whatever. So you have to rebut that. You see what I'm saying? Uh, solution or both? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and again, just like in the debates, how you know what the counter argument is, is because you're sort of like incorporating that into your response. Like, I'm responding to this counter argument. Okay? <coughs> Same formula. All right, and then you have your conclusion. The only way we're using the book is like stating the social injustice present in the book and then how do you like take action into it? Okay, so, so, okay, let me just do a little line. Now we're dividing. So if we're just talking about the autobiography, remember your choices are a straight research paper. Here's the social injustice, and here's the causes. Or a persuasive essay. Here's the social injustice, and here are the solutions that my author proposes. Yeah, it's more on causes. Uh, the books are just different. Yeah. So honestly, for prison writings, most people are probably going to lean toward research paper. For It Calls You Back, um, all my It Calls You Back people are doing the persuasive because it's really got a lot of solutions in it. You know, it's like trial, trial, like, trial. Yeah. So we find the causes and then we make our own solutions and back it up. No, no. You, if you're just doing the research paper, you're not you're not doing solutions right now. Oh, uh, just causes? Yeah. Because uh -huh. remember, your senior thesis is a research, it's like a two-parter. It's a research paper that's just like the history and the causes of your topic, and then the solutions. Okay. Right now, the outline you've given me on your senior thesis is just history and causes. You're choosing uh, for the book which you want to focus on. I don't care. It's just more for you practicing what we're doing for senior thesis. That's it. We're just practicing the same model over a different topic. So you can choose. You can be like, yeah, I want to do a research paper, or no, I want to do a persuasive. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. So you can choose any social justice in the book? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Because some of your books, well, I shouldn't say some, they all talk about multiple social injustices. I mean, especially Luis Rodriguez and Malcolm X were, the, I mean, I mean, there's just a ton. Okay. The group is just to, like, help you process and synthesize information. You don't, you're not doing anything in collaboration with them. Okay. Other questions on just what I've told you so far? No? Good? Okay. All right. So what I want to do next then is go over an excellent paper. And this is just review because you guys, in theory, already know what an excellent paper should look like. You spent lots of time on this with Ehrlichman. But based on the outlines that I saw, we definitely need to review. Okay. All right. So we're going to look at um, this, is how this paper. And um, I, yesterday, every time I do this, like people... Like when you go over a good paper, people always interpret it as like I'm saying that their paper was like junk and don't interpret it that way, okay? She was a lit lab tutor for like two years with Cynthia and so, I mean, obviously if you've been doing that tutoring people for a couple of years, like, yeah, your paper is going to be pretty good the first time around, okay? So don't feel like that means that you're Man, a crappy sad. writer, right? Okay, <laughs> so... Um, the first thing that I want to talk about is the hooks. Now you have to remember that your hook needs to grab your reader, okay? 
and, and just be practical. Like it, it's it just common sense. Like when you go to a job interview, you want to make a good first impression. You have to think of it the same way as with a paper or anything you write, a letter, anything. Okay. You don't want to be drab and boring up front, or else they're just going to like circle file it, right? Nobody wants to keep reading. So some of you have really dry or academic topics, and it's tough to find out, like find a captivating hook. But her topic it could be kind of dry as well, and she still found a way to find a captivating hook. She's got, in 1996, the Federal Drug Administration approved the erection drug Viagra. Viagra obviously had no health care or prevention functions, yet it took just less than two months for half of all prescriptions of Viagra to be covered by health insurers. Okay, now I'm not sure exactly what her topic is yet, unless I've read the title, but but I'm interested. It's like, hmm, what's she talking about? What's she, where's she going to go from here? All right, that's interesting. Now, this is not actually a citation error. I thought it was, but I'm going to tell you how to fix it. Her, her author's last name was actually Paige. Okay, it was actually Paige. Now, in your um, citation packets, I know you guys just poured over those things and, you know, live and breathe that material, but it really actually, you should, <laughs> especially at the beginning, because in there, and again, this is all review, it tells you how to do all your in-text citations. And I just want to remind you, you always have a choice. You can either say John Page, um, head writer at LA Times, said blah, 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 or you can put it in the parentheses at the end. Give your quote and then just put page 15. Now because this is like confusing, what she should do is put the signal phrase at the beginning, okay, and cite it at the beginning, within it. So she should start off, John Page, head writer at blah, 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 and then said blah, 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 okay? So that's what you do there. Now, any, there was a lot of people on Outlines who had citation errors. Like they just weren't doing their in-text citation correctly. How do you fix that? How do you know how to fix it? Go back to the packet. Okay, the first part of the packet where there was all the different like headings and kind of paragraphs and stuff like that, that's where it tells you all that basic information. Okay, and when you look at the chart, the first five are like, how do you cite an author that's an organization? How do you cite when there's no author? I mean, those are essential. You need to go and like read those so that you know how to in-text cite. Not the works cited page, but how do you cite it in the text? Okay? Little things like if you have no author and you're just going like book title or article title, you only put in parentheses, if you're going to put in parentheses, the first word of the title. Unless there's another article or book that has the same first word, like the then you would just give like the first two words. Or you can give the book title or article title with, within the signal phrase, right? According to um, the book, social justice, you know, whatever. All right, background info. This is not the case with contraceptives, which are simply devices used to prevent a pregnancy. Politicians today still debate whether or not insurance companies should cover the cost of contraceptives. Sure, anyone can purchase a condom at a liquor store, but these are not as effective as the intrauterine device, patch, pill, or Depravera, which are also more expensive than a condom. Hispanic women, because of multiple factors, struggle more with accessing quality contraceptives than their white counterparts. Okay, this is concise to the point, but gives us lots of information. I totally understand the background of this particular issue and why she feels it's an issue. That's what your goal is. By the way, almost every single thing in this paper is a, well, everything that I'm going to go over is a four. It's already a four. This is her first draft. She didn't even have anybody help her. Okay? The only error in it is like point three concrete detail that she has to change, but we're only going over the first paragraph. All right. Her thesis statement. Okay? Socioeconomic class, religion and culture, and inadequate funding make it tougher for Hispanic women to access quality contraceptives. Now, again, it's simple, direct, and, and a lot of you guys are giving me thesis statements that just, they're so wordy, sometimes because you just aren't 100% sure about what is your claim really, or how do I talk about this claim, or what really is my point. You don't really fully understand your topic in order to be really direct. The second thing that's useful to improving your thesis statement is um, everybody by now has done their writer's reference sentence style exercises, in theory. By the way, I'm taking the grade 
the final grade for those two MLA and sentence style at 5 o'clock today. <gasps> so if you're a person who hasn't completed all yours, you have till 5 o'clock today. Okay. okay. So Within the sentence style section is quizzes on parallelism. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. yeah. Those are the most important quizzes for improving your thesis statement. Okay? Because if your thesis statement isn't parallel in structure, it makes it harder to understand and you're not communicating, expressing yourself in a clear way. All right? Now, one of the things structurally that I want to point out is um, a lot of you guys could fix your thesis statement simply by doing what she did, which is she put her points first and then put her claim. That's it, totally fine. It doesn't matter. You don't have to put the claim first and then the points. Either way, as long as they're there. Because sometimes, like, if, if the points are what are causing the social justice, it's easier to structure it this way. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Any questions so far? No? All right. So next, we're going to look at a topic sentence. Now, on your outline, there are detailed notes on here about how to do each of these different parts. Some of you are not reading this, okay? Even though we went or or you weren't listening in class either or whatever. And you use this with Ehrlichman, so this should be review, okay? But under topic sentence, it is exactly like your thesis statement. The claim plus one point. Your thesis statement is claim plus three points. And your topic sentence is just claim plus one point. Don't deviate from this formula, okay? Because at this point in your writing career, you just need to be clear, concise, and direct, all right? So for a topic sentence, the socioeconomic class a Hispanic woman belongs to affects her access to quality contraceptives. The biggest problem most of you are making is you're giving me a hook. A lot of people are giving me a hook instead of a topic sentence. You just want to be, and some of you might feel like, oh, but I want to be creative. No, this is not the time to be creative. This is a topic sentence. You need to tell me very clearly what is the claim and point of this paragraph, okay? So that's how you do it. Questions on that? Because that's a really important piece that a lot of people make mistakes on. Okay. Lead in. I have people who have given me a second concrete detail on lead-in. Quite a few people. A lead-in is just introducing your concrete detail. So she's got Hispanic women from different socioeconomic classes obviously earn different amounts of money. The more a woman and her husband earn, the more secure and financially stable the woman feels, and thus the more confident she feels to have children. A woman who is poor, as are many Hispanic women, will not want to have kids because she does not have the resources to provide for those kids. The National Latina Institute for Reproductive Health explains that. That's her lead-in, right? She's introduced and set up her concrete detail, and then, like, introduced. You, you, she's giving the credentials of her concrete detail. It's just like saying John Page. Well, who the hell is John Page, right? He's head writer at LA Times, or whatever he is, really. Harvard professor, okay? The concrete details. Latinas are disproportionately poor, and birth control co-pays are expensive. According to the Guttmacher Institute, 50% of women aged 18 to 34, including Latinas, said there had been a time when the cost of prescription contraceptive, a prescription contraceptive, prevented consistent use. Now, for every concrete detail, you need to ask yourself this question. Does this concrete detail actually prove the point of my paragraph? And does this one? Yes. What was the point of her paragraph? Socioeconomic. Socioeconomic, right? Is the reason why they don't have access. And does this concrete detail prove socioeconomic? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay? So always ask yourself that. Even though it seems like you're like, oh, yeah, I got this. But just pause. And ask yourself that question because the people who don't have solid concrete details, that's why. Because it's just, it's not proving the point of their paragraph. It might be about the same subject, but it doesn't prove the point. All right, commentary. Um, most people's commentary is not where it should be. But that's harder, okay? Commentary is always more difficult. You're trying to. Um, if we go back to our outline, what we've got here, 
commentary is sort of the because and the therefore. Okay? This is my point. This point proves my claim because this, therefore this. Right? You're explaining the meaning of the evidence without simply repeating. I got a lot of repeaters. And you're drawing a conclusion. You're tying the evidence back to the argument of the paragraph and the thesis claim. And remember, the job of commentary is to explain how and why your evidence proves your point. So let's look at her example here. All right. If those women and their husbands had earned more money, they could have been able to afford the birth control. That is obviously not the case. The women the Guttmacher Institute studied were too poor to be able to buy quality contraceptives, leaving them vulnerable to sexually transmitted diseases and unwanted pregnancies. The socioeconomic class of these women ended up hindering their ability to purchase contra quality contraceptives that could have possibly helped those women move up in socioeconomic class. Okay? So she's clearly going through, and what I call it is like connecting the dots, right? She's like connecting all the dots for you. I don't have to infer anything. Now, even though for a 12th grader, this is already four, one way that she could improve this is by, you know, adding in like another small layer of detail, which is that um, young girls, particularly high school and college, and now again, not just in LA, because LA is not representative of the rest of the United States, are, it's going to be really socially awkward and uncomfortable to go buy condoms, right? That's not going to be something that's going to be comfortable for them, right? If you live in a small town and everybody knows you, you don't want to go in and buy condoms from somebody you go to ch church with, right? You know what I'm saying? If you um, are just a, a young, kind of unconfident girl, you don't want to go buy condoms from a male, you know? You can go into CVS or whatever and it's like a male clerk, right? It's embarrassing. So it's really important, this whole idea that, like, you know, if these things are expensive, then, you know, you can't just assume, oh, well, it's too expensive for you, oh, you should just go buy condoms, right? So, because there's that factor, which is a big one, right? The other thing that she could talk about on this, and I'm just trying to show you other ways that you can analyze and go deeper, is that if you're saying, well, no, wait, let me... Let me pause on this one until I go to the next one. Because then, uh, let's look at the mini transition. Okay. So she says, no, we just, we just, all we're trying to do is just transition into the next concrete detail with that mini transition. Okay. It's just setting it up. So poor women, however, do have some resources available to them, such as any and all clinics funded by Title X, a government program aimed at providing contraceptive services to low-income communities. The Office of Population Affairs explains that two-thirds, no, she gave, you know, her citation, two-thirds of the 7.1 million women obtaining care at publicly funded family planning centers receive services at the more than 4,000 Title X supported sites nationwide. In fact, these sites are able to serve one quarter of the 17 million women in this country who are in need of publicly supported contraceptive services. Seven in 10 of these clients have incomes below the poverty level. Now on the surface, this sounds like what? A cause or a solution? Solution. On the surface, yeah. right. It sounds like a solution. So you could be thinking, oh, but this isn't really evidence of her point. However, one point that I want to um, emphasize is that there's a difference between you coming up with a solution and you pointing out that one of the causes of the problem is a totally dysfunctional solution, which is not working. Right? Does that make sense? Yes. That's what she's doing. So here she's talking about the fact that, okay, there's these clinics, right? And these clinics are the only way that poor women have access to contraceptives. But they are subject to immediate change when laws change. Every time a new politician comes into office, in, it can be in state or federal, places like Planned Parenthood run the risk of either being closed down or having the services that they can offer be completely changed. And what Planned Parenthood can offer in one state is different than another. 
Like where I grew up, Kansas City um, is on a state line, right? So there's a state line and like the, the Missouri side and the Kansas side. One side, one state didn't allow any kind of services except for um, like the, oh, I guess it's called the rhythm method, that's it. Like that, the family planning method for, for religious people where you're not using any sort of like contraceptive, it's just like counting days, right? If you wanted any contraception, you had to go across the state line because the other state allowed that stuff, right? So that can change by state. So, so that's why this is a really good, solid point to bring up. The other thing, so that could be closed down. So again, if, if a law gets passed and denies you access to these services, you're out of luck, as opposed to somebody who has a higher socioeconomic bracket, right? Who could like go to a private doctor and get that stuff. Now something else to think about, let's look at her commentary. Wait, I need to turn the page. Okay, so hold that thought. Let me read the commentary first before I go on. Okay, this resource at first glance seems like a solution to the problem. However, so she addressed that. However, there are many problems with Title, title X supported clinics. First, funding is often threatened by politicians. Then some of these clinics only provide preventative services. If a woman does become pregnant, many of the clinics are not prepared for it, leaving the woman more vulnerable to choosing to have an abortion because she cannot afford another mouth to feed in her home. However, had the woman earned a higher income and consequently belonged to a higher socioeconomic class, the pregnancy might have been welcomed in a more positive way. Once again, the socioeconomic class of Hispanic women proved to be a detrimental factor in their access to contraceptives. Okay. She goes through everything that I just talked about. Now, what I told her, and again, this is like how to take it beyond with her commentary taking it a step further. So one other point that's important to draw out is that if you, like IUDs, Depro, and all those things are like 100% effective. Is a condom? No. The problem with a condom is it, its effectiveness is contingent on a second person, okay? Does the woman have total control over whether or not that condom is effective? No, because you have stuff like, um, you have stuff like maybe a guy doesn't want to wear it or doesn't want to put it on until the very end, right? And all of those things affect its effectiveness. And you have things like it could break, even though that's not really something that happens as much. What happens more often is people just like, they don't want to put it on until the very end. So now what you have is you have to convince your partner to do something, to participate. If you go and get the Depro shot, is all the control in your power? Yeah. The other person has no say, right? You have all control over your own body, and a condom doesn't give you that. So that would have been my suggestion for her, for how she could take this commentary to another level, to draw out that point. And that's what we're talking about with analysis. With analysis, you want to think about, like, okay, so if these women are... are the only way to get access to this 100% effective birth control is by going to this clinic. If the clinic is shut down or they simply pass a law that says we can't do this for you anymore, now their only choice is a method of birth control, which is not giving them total control of their own body. Okay. I have a question. Yes. What, what do you say to um, questions like, well, why don't they just stop having sex? Or like, for example, with me, like, since I'm um, focusing like criminals, uh -huh. like, I know they're gonna ask me something stupid, like, well, what if they do this to your mom? You know, like, would you want them to be, have a chance to improve? Like, what do you say to things like that? Oh, well, um, it's sort of like what we're doing in the solution paper. You need to think about that other side, right? So that's what you're bringing up. You're bringing up the counter arguments, okay? And then what would you say? in terms of that counter argument. Well, okay, so let's just say you have, you're talking about criminals, and what would be what would be the point? That they should have to rot in prison for the rest of their lives because they committed a crime? And you're saying the counter argument would be what if that crime was committed against your mom? No, like, I'm trying to say, like, they should have more more programs to rehabilitate themselves. So, 
but then what if somebody tells me, like, what if that happened to your mom? Like, like what if they did something to your mom, would you want them to be able to come back up? Oh, okay, I understand. All right. Let's all think about that. That's a great question for, like, how do you come up with that commentary? If you're talking about somebody who's committed a crime and the solution is just to lock them up for a lifetime, what's the, what's the counter argument against somebody that says, well, they should just be locked up? You would be the better man. But you have to go. Yeah, no, but let's think, because he's suggesting rehabilitation isn't effective by just locking them up. So what would the rebuttal be? If you're saying that locking someone up doesn't rehabilitate, doesn't do anything, then what's your rebuttal to somebody that says, oh, well, if, if somebody commits a crime, and what if they did that to your mom, you would just want them locked up. Would you want them locked up? Well, what yeah, you I want would, them but to I don't want to say that, because then I just know my whole thesis in the trash. Right. If you read, if, okay, can you say that one more time? Well, I just said that you would want them to be rehabilitated so that they don't have to do it again so they could better themselves. If you actually rehabilitate them, what have you done? Help them. Help them. Yeah, you've helped them. You've stopped the cycle. You've helped them in whoever they take care of. Yeah, because let's be honest. Even if somebody gets a really long prison sentence, okay, you know, you know, even Luis Rodriguez's kid ended up getting, um, what did he get, 30, 42 years in prison? He's already out. He's been out for a couple of years, right? Because they have all kinds of programs set up to, to let you get out if you're like on good behavior or doing productive things. So if you don't ever rehabilitate the person, I mean, you know, giving them a lot of years, which seem like a life sentence, doesn't mean they're going to be locked up forever. And if you don't ever rehabilitate, okay, it's like the death penalty, okay? Okay, so for the death penalty one, you have the rebuttal that you wouldn't want the person killed, but there's a stronger rebuttal to that. There's an even stronger rebuttal. Does that have to do with money? What would be the strongest rebuttal for not killing people as a result of their crime? Yeah, that's true, but there's one even bigger. You should know because you're the one doing this. So let's think about what are some of the reasons in, because this is, this is why in a lot of states they do away with the death penalty. What has been the problem with the death penalty besides cost? What have people done? Oh, they make mistakes? Yes, they make mistakes. Look, Cynthia should just be writing all your comments. <laughs> they make mistakes. Can you take it back if you kill someone? No. I mean, how many times do they exonerate someone, meaning prove they're innocent, exonerate someone after, like, years and years, decades in prison? Of 148? 148 in California, what, per year or total? Last year alone, oh, come on. Yeah. Do you understand? 140 yeah. people. That's a lot. That is a lot. Uh, that right there is your biggest rebuttal. Okay? And, and if you think about it, your commentary is a lot like rebuttal. Okay? Because you're thinking about analyzing and, like, really strengthening that argument. This is a little bit off, but is that guy from prison writing? Is he still in jail? Yeah. Yeah, he's still in jail. When you go onto his website, um, it has the quote that we looked at, and then it literally, it has these numbers at the bottom that are constantly changing of how many seconds, minutes, hours, days, years he spent in prison. And it keeps going. Huh? Yeah. The sad thing is President Obama has the power to like tomorrow or today or at lunch write up a document and say Leonard Peltier should be free. Why was he put in jail? Why was he put in jail like, uh, prison people? He, he for standing up for his people, basically. Yeah. Yeah. They thought he was yeah. shot. They thought, but he didn't. He Can didn't somebody say. finish the sentence? I know. You guys yeah, exactly what I'm thinking. Okay, so, Luz. Uh, so, he 
During the time they wanted to kick out, uh, like they wanted to put the Indians in the cities, and then he didn't want to, like, well, he had, he started a movement, like, so they could stay out where they were, but they wanted to take over all the land, and then they, I guess, they had a team against the Indians, and then they wanted to go fight them, and then, and then they had, like, a little war, and then supposedly two FBI agents died. Wasn't it that he wasn't, like, a riot? No, yeah, he wasn't even there. He was not even in the state. Okay, like not there, not even in the state. And and what is well? Let me back up because what is the real reason why? Because the, they made that one lady testify that he yeah. was there, yeah, and stuff, but they scared her. They scared her with something about him too. Right. Yeah. They they used. I mean, they basically coerced her into testifying against him, and she killed herself afterward. Mm -hmm. Would it be the Sundance thing? What is it? Oh, right, right. They excluded the info that said that he wasn't there, right? No? Could Farnham be part of it? You know how he said, like, yes, you fulfill the Sundance or something like that? Can that be part of it too or no? Wait, say it one more time. You know how he said he had to fulfill the Sundance, uh -huh. like in the beginning? Can that be part of it? No? Of why he was accused? Well, not accused, like, because you know how in the packet they said, uh, Miss mm -hmm. They said, uh, like, they forced all Indians to not do the Sundance and all that stuff. Oh, no. no. What is the real reason why they targeted him um, to lock him up? It's in there. Yeah. Because why? Because he was, like, one of the leaders of the movement. Yeah, he was the leader of the movement. Yeah, yeah. No, but in the book it says there is no leader. He just said that. But he was a head guy. Yeah, well, he was a thorn some, in their side. Um, could we use that? As like some detail for our essay yeah. about the Sundance thing. Yeah. But but just to be clear, what Mo was saying, him participating in Sundance was not a reason for oh, no, this. I was just, I was just wondering. No, I know, but uh, cause I'm talking about yeah. how they were stripped from like the right, so I can. Yeah, that's it. totally fine. Yeah, of course, that's a reliable source. Right. Um, and and I put the link on. If you go to the autobiography of social justice page, I put the link up there. Okay, so you can just go directly to the link to cite it yourself. How old is he? Yeah, he's an old man. Isn't he supposed to be in there for like two years? No, two sentences. Go to his website. It's really interesting. It's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, the, the other thing is that, um, and not to digress too much from our little task at hand, but this is important. Shortly after he was convicted, the Freedom of Information Act was passed, mm -hmm. which made it legal, legally required that the government has to supply information to the public if you ask for it. And, and when people ask for the information, the government admits they have no idea who killed the two agents. No, but didn't right? they say also no, they in the say book? That it's lost or something, but they don't have it or something. No, the, the government actually, their official statement is they do not know who killed the two FBI agents. There is zero, zero proof that the government has that Peltier did it. Well, and the bigger thing that you have to look at, and um, actually Victor has my book, Agents of Repression, but in the in this particular period of time in the 70s, what they did was they targeted every really active head leader of Black Panthers and AIM and any other sort of dissident group that was creating problems for the government, like working people up, and they they imprisoned all of them or they disappeared, right? They killed them, like Malcolm X and um, Martin Luther King. So the government actually had like like a plan to get rid of these people that were stirring up trouble. In the book, it says that uh, um, the guy says that like the FBI people were shooting each other also. Like, yeah. They they shot yeah. And yeah, and actually, the theory is that those two FBI agents were actually killed by other FBI agents, yeah. and it was all a complete setup. Why? Because they wanted to get the main. Yeah, because they wanted a. Uh, uh, because there was nothing they could prosecute him for. He hadn't done anything breaking the law. 
Okay, let me bring it back. I just have one more thing I want to say or show you about this essay, and then we're going to move on, okay? And that is transition sentences, okay? Just stay with me one more minute here. The transition sentences is a formula. <laughs> on your quick notes outline, the formula is just not only, but also. You're going to take that thesis statement, okay, you're going to take that thesis statement, which originally said, uh, socioeconomic class, religion, and culture, make it tougher for Hispanic women to find access to health care, and you can make every transition statement right now. Not only does so socioeconomic class make it tough for Hispanic women to find access to quality contraceptives, but also religion and culture, okay? And don't deviate from that, okay? Because again, you just want to get the job done and get it done simply, directly, and concisely, okay? When you guys start being all like creative, honestly, until you're a master writer, most of you don't do it effectively, okay? And that's not an insult, that's just saying like, you always want to learn the rules first and the basics, and then when you become a master, then you can break the rules. Follow me? Okay. Questions on anything that I went over? Okay, for how many of you was the clarification helpful? Raise your hand if it was helpful. You should have done this on Wednesday so we can fix it back. You know what? To be honest, um, I actually didn't think we needed to because I figured you guys were seniors. This is just this is just everything that you've been doing for four years. I mean, huh? Well, because you've been doing this for four years and you use the same model. I made this and Ehrlichman took it last year and he used it. I didn't know it had to be so decent. Yeah, I mean, you guys have been using this for, this is your second year, so that's why I just didn't think it was necessary, but, um, but now it's done. Okay, Janet, can you hit stop recording? Cut! I don't know, hopefully. So I turned, oh, did it happen, no? Did it shut off by itself?